Welcome to the Early Wedge presented by BetMGM. I am your host, Derek Cohen, a.k.a. EC. Make sure to like this video, and if you are not already, subscribe to the Sportsline YouTube page. So many good things, including we have the host of one of the programs that is pretty much dominates the Sportsline uh, YouTube feed, so we'll talk more about that as we go along. But let's bring in the stars of the show for the RBC Heritage preview show. We have the host of the Early Edge. Every Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern, one C. Najad, one of the best golf betters on the planet, and one of the smartest golf minds that you will ever find, who will probably take more of my money either this week or another week. It's one Patrick McDonald from CBS Sports. Gentlemen, uh, great to have you here. Great to be on with you once again. Just a, a quick thought of each. Patrick, I'll start with you. From last week's Masters, we knew Scotty was the person to beat. Did anything about what we saw surprise you? Uh, I would say kind of how he, how he got it done, right? It, it was a tournament defined by a short game, I would say, for mm -hmm. sixty the first 65 holes or the first 64 holes or whatever. The math is escaping me. Uh, but outside the second nine on Sunday, his short game got the, got the job done, and he kind of coasted with his B plus, A minus game. And when he needed to put his foot on the, on the gas, he did, and he ran away with it. See, did we learn a lesson from a live betting perspective that if it's if there's nine holes to go and Scotty Scheffler is right up top? I mean, we saw what happened with Steven Yeager the other week where he got him. But I would say nine times out of ten, should we just bet Scotty and take our money at that point? It's interesting because when he's like tied or he's in a scenario where there's a few other players, I think the answer is like an auto yes. But the thing is, the other players that were in contention, Ludwig, uh, Colin Morikawa and Max Homa, like, you know, it's not like it was a situation where it was like a Steven Yeager, for example. So, I mean, I think the answer to that is, is a pretty quick yes, but I, it, we could see a scenario where one of those three ended up winning the Masters and not Scotty. I, the difference is Scotty, I mean, Patrick said it, it, it sounds very like narrative -y, like he put his foot on the gas. It's like very cliche. Well, he didn't literally put his foot on the gas, but he clearly has a switch, a gear that he goes into that some of these golfers, like a Xander Shoffley, for example, who we've been talking about in that exact context, can't seem to find. And, and like, I, I, I think that, that there is an it factor that some of these competitors have across all sports, and we saw it really, really on display at the Masters in the back nine. Yeah, but also when you look at, Patrick, you look at the bonehead deci decisions that some of these guys made. I mean, I, Morikawa trying to get too cute with a bunker shot on nine. Ludwig uh, t trying to take a shot. What was that? Uh, 11. And he goes in the water. I mean, at some point, was it just the threat of Scotty? Was it Nur? I mean, what what gets these guys? Can you explain that? I, I think it was real on nine. I honestly think it was the second shot that got Colin trying to get too aggressive uh, with that one. You can't miss left to that green with that pin. And then from there, he was kind of just in jail and tried to hit a perfect bunker shot and, and made double. Uh, Ludwig. Probably a little bit of inexperience firing at that pin, uh, you know, feeling himself obviously after the first nine he had and, and just hitting the wrong shot at the wrong time. But for Scotty, it's just all about discipline and patience. He understands that you're not going to win the Masters around Amen Corner. You're probably going to lose it, though. Think about 2022, Cameron Smith, he lost the Masters on number 12 when he hit in the water. And it was kind of a, a pretty similar round and pretty similar situation this year. All right, we'll start with our storylines for the RBC Heritage there at uh, in Hilton Head uh, Island, South Carolina. It looks like a beautiful place, Patrick. I assume you'll be there. I'm guessing. No, I'm too tired. I, I mean, my uh, my financial advisor is kind of begging me to get out there. My uh, my big money people with RBC, but uh, I am not going this week. All right. Well, a few guys <laughs> that are going. Well, you and, and Victor Hovland and Hideki Matsuyama are not going. But see, we're looking at a few players to possibly bounce back this week. Tell me about your storyline. Well, what I think is really interesting, and this is something we, and I should say I highlight a lot in terms of players who are in the superstar status, they can flash at any time. And I'm just very curious, like Patrick Cantley, Max Homa, Colin Morikawa, they have been pretty bad all of 2024 and then at augusta like they really like we, we we saw colin and max kind of competing down the stretch and by the way patrick cantley who we talked about as sort of like a long shot dfs play i talked about at the end of the show last week i mean he finished 22nd it wasn't great but i mean he was kind of like near the conversation i don't think a lot of people expected him to be so what i'm really interested in here in this full not i shouldn't say full field but in this very talented field where we've got everybody other than the live guys hideki and victor hovland 
Like, are those guys back for 2024 or was that just kind of a flash in the pan? I kind of lean towards all three of them are going to start to play better the, the entirety of the rest of this calendar year. But I think it's really interesting to keep an eye on all three. And I, and I do think all three of them, I would say in the order of Cantley, Morikawa and Homa, have a chance to win the RBC Heritage. Well, there was one guy that's on my do not bet list who I wanted to take this week. Actually, a couple of guys. We'll talk about that later in the show. I'm going to give my storyline second. And, and I guess I'll, I guess I'll turn this to you, Sia. What scares you most about betting Scotty Scheffler this week as a, as a huge favorite? Is it the threat of a withdrawal or the postmaster's letdown? I think it's a combination of things. Listen, I'm, I'm looking for an excuse or several excuses to fade a guy that's plus 400. I did the same thing uh, last week at the Masters, and frankly, I don't regret it. I, I mean, I, I think that field was so talented that it, I think plus 400 was too short. I still think it was too short looking at it in the rearview mirror. But the bottom line is, yeah, I guess there is a slight threat that his wife might may go in labor. I mean, I don't think it's actually going to happen. Um, but that's on his mind for sure. And it is a possibility. And there is probably a master's letdown. No, I don't think Scotty Scheffler is that type that really has those sort of, it's not his personality type to kind of let down and let go and, and shift down, if you will. Uh, with that said, it's still a talented field and plus 400 is too short. So that's why I'm not betting him. Okay, fair enough. Now, Patrick, as far as betting this tournament, now I'm doing it a little bit differently. And we'll talk about that later in the show for outrights. But you think that maybe this is the week that some of these guys are going to get Scotty. No? Yeah. So I was asked the question yesterday with the topic in mind, the Scotty slam, right? Could, could he win the career grand slam? And I said, I think the biggest hurdle is going to be the PGA championship, being a new father, having new uh, variables introduced into his life and all this stuff. And I think this is probably the best chance for some of these big names like a Rory, like a Cantlay, like a Morikawa to kind of catch him, not like sort of sleeping, not really, but like if there's ever going to be a letdown for Scotty Scheffler, you would think it's the week after the Masters where he flies home before flying to Hilton Head. So he has that extra travel. He has his wife on his mind. He has a potential new child on his mind. And he has that huge emotional high of last week. So if there's ever a chance for these guys to get Scotty Scheffler on a golf course he hasn't played a ton, you would think it is this week. But then again, it's Scotty Scheffler, and he's the best player in the world by far. So by far, you got, right. I mean, you, you got to weigh those two. Yeah, I mean, this it's unbelievable what he's done in the last month. 1-1, one, one, T2-1. I mean, that is, and the three tournaments that he's won have been, you know, $20 million plus purses. It's absolutely wild. All right, time for DFS. I'm going to sit out this week. We're going to let the professionals go to work here. We're going to start with UC. I actually love your card here, uh, but we're going to talk about your fade first because this guy just finished second at the Masters, and now you're fading Ludwig? What, what's going on here? Yeah, I don't feel comfortable fading Ludwig, but the reality is he's really popular and we're, we're, we're getting his stock at the highest possible price when it comes to DFS, probably in the betting market too, at least as it stands now, like versus historically. And and again, from a ownership standpoint, he's he's just going to be relatively high. Now, now keep in mind when you're looking at ownership numbers to the extent any of you are, like this is a case where we only have about 70 golfers. So, so you are going to see elevated ownership, but guys like Ludwig, guys like Xander, uh, because of obvious reasons, these guys have elevated ownership, and, and I'm just happy to pivot off of a stock being really high. So I'm going to pivot off of Ober, and I'll probably, at the top, I'll probably be looking at guys like Cantlay or Zalatoris, who's who's much further down. And listen, Zalatoris has had problems with the putter over the last few, but the three and four, I should say four tournaments prior to that, he was gaining with the putter in a pretty significant way. So I think he can rebound with the putter, but the ball striking and the approach play and likely the greens and regulation, I mean, he's checking all of those boxes and I just think he's too cheap. What's really cool is that because he hasn't really flashed lately, his ownership isn't going to be as high as some of those other names I just mentioned. And that's particularly surprising, knowing that his price is a lot lower than some of those big time names. So I think it's a perfect time to play Zalatoris. I'd say the same about Shane Lowry, who was unbelievable on approach last week so good best in the field he lost over seven strokes with the putter i mean it was it was hurtful watching him ladies and gentlemen i mean it truly was because i hit every single one of my finishing positions right except for the shane lowry one i was four for five in finishing positions i gave an extra one over the weekend xander to top 10 and, and that one hit to 12 as well so 
I mean, you could say five out of six, but I lost three out of four of my head-to-head matchups. Two of them were Shane Lowry related. So the only finishing position I lost, Shane Lowry, top 20. And and two of the three head-to-heads that I lost were Shane Lowry involved. He was such a joke with the putter. I don't want to say he was like not even trying, but he wasn't even scaring the cup. Like it wasn't close. He was never close. He was losing like three strokes a day post Thursday. It was unbelievable with All of that said, the ball striking is there. And I do think a guy like Shane Lowry, we've seen it, can absolutely flash with the putters. History here isn't bad either. So I I really like him at at, at 8,500. And keep in mind, this is a DFS discussion, right? So if people saw what they saw last week, they're probably not going to be as on Shane Lowry as maybe some of the guys around him. So I think you're getting somewhat of an ownership discount. And Cam Davis, I'll keep this one short. Uh, we're, we're seeing something from Cameron Davis. Uh, and, and so I, I'm willing to kind of be in somewhat early, a little late, but somewhat early on Cam Davis at 7,400. Uh, I'm really seeing something with the ball striking. We know he has it with the short game time to time. So I think that's a good price. I think that's an excellent card and you get an A plus in my book. Uh, but all right, Patrick, your card is you're going to the bargain basement. So, you know, and I don't usually go that that far down. I don't go to the bargain basement. Unfortunately, Grayson Sig is not in this tournament. So you mm. cannot pick him this week. We'll just wait for next week. Uh, the uh, was that the Byron Nelson? Is that is that next week? I the think Zurich. so. Anyways, it was, oh Zurich, yeah. So two weeks Byron Nelson. Okay. Uh, all right. So you're fading Patrick Cantlay, who has a sterling history here. I mean, of all the guys that are above ten thousand, there are not many with a better history than Patrick Cantlay. Why are you giving him the old fade? I don't think there are any better better history than than. Well, he uh, hasn't won. He hasn't Patrick won Cantlay. here. He's done everything but win. He has right. that one miscut, and then right. what is it? Five other top tens, with those being all like podium finishes, pretty much. Uh, and I think people will see the ball striking from last week, get all giddy, be like, "All right, we're getting in on Patrick Cantlay." And I just, I, I don't trust him yet. I, I, I do not trust Patrick Cantlay at ten two. So I will fade it. People will look at the course history and be okay playing him. That's fine. I will live to see another day. What I will not. Stand for is Matthew Pavon at seven thousand. How dare they? <laughs> How dare they? Unbelievable. He finishes T twelve at the Masters last week in his debut. Uh, T five on the European Tour. His start before playing great golf. We know what this guy can do. All in on the Frenchman. Chris Kirk seventy seven hundred. Loved him last week. He did nothing to sway me off that position, so I'm going back to him as well. And then it's not a week if I'm not rolling with my guy. Russ Bus Henley at 8,100, a positional golf course that you got to find the fairway. Iron play is at a premium. And you know what? His putter is humming this year. His iron play is actually taking a little step back, mm-hmm. but it was great at the Texas Open. So that's given me enough to go with him once again at 8,100. Okay. I, I'm good with Russ Bus. What, what's the grade? I, what's the grade? Uh, a B. I mean, I haven't gone that far. I, I'm just looking. I was top of board here. You know, I just was. Wow. This is a signature event. I'm not going wow. lower. I'm sorry. You got to be. You got to be here. We'll see later in the show if your grade goes up. Now, when it comes to FRLs, Sia has a couple of players that I actually will talk about later in the show. So, including the first one who was on the do not bet to win list, but I have circumvented that this week. That's my tease. All right, see, so explain why you like these four oh, guys. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I have a feeling I know how you circumvented it. And I oh, it's better. Hear... It's better than most. I will just say that. Better than better most. Better than most. Uh, love that. All right, Cameron Young. Listen, this is one of the first tournaments in a while. I, I should say maybe in the last two or three where I'm actually not betting Cameron Young outright. I don't think he's a bad bet at all. I just kept my card, as you'll see, relatively short. He didn't make the cut. Very close. Uh, but first round leader, I mean, is certainly in play. He was, the, I believe, in 2022 was the first round leader here as well. Uh, he has a, a morning tea time, which which I am looking for. Although I will say that again, 70 players, we don't have a you know the the, the start times are generally somewhat close to each other. But I, I have taken mostly morning into the afternoon, like prior to like noon, for example. So not nobody going off at one or two o'clock. But I do like Cameron Young at 30 to one. Uh, Corey Connors also has done well here in first rounds, and he really is a classic great course fit. He's a guy that I think some people have on their outright cards. I don't know that he can get it done in this field uh, over four rounds, but in one round, absolutely great course fit. Cam Davis, we already talked about him. Definitely seeing him raise the level of his game. And Christian Bezidin, how a guy I bring up a lot on this show, mm-hmm. um, maybe not the field for him to win one outright, but I, I love where the game is with Cbez, and I think 50 to one's a good place for him. And for the record, I have couple of long shots, one long shot outright, and one long shot first round leader as well, just to stay tuned for that. 
Yeah, I think Seabed is the next uh, Steven Yeager as somebody that you will will to victory at some point this season. <laughs> you, and we just need Patrick to get Grace and Sig into the into the winner's circle, and then we're going to feel really good about life here on the, this program. The, the, the one thing I'll say about Seabed is what I love about him from a first-round leader standpoint in particular. First of all, the history is pretty good here. It's not, like, amazing, but this is Seabed at the end of the day, not Scotty Scheffler. Uh the approach play and the putter like can get red hot for him. Can it, can he do it for four rounds? Actually, maybe, but I know he can do it for one. And so I think he's like a perfect candidate to splash for a first round. And can you remind everyone once again, from two weeks ago, what you hit in this market? Yeah, it was Akshay Batia at 65 to one. I had some close calls this year so far. I was kind of mad. I didn't cash one. Like I think I had Hideki in one that really should have come in a couple of others, but we finally cashed Akshay Batia at 65 to one first round leader. And, and all right, there you go. Now coming up next, will Patrick McDonald take my showdown that I am going to propose? Let's hear from one of our sponsors beforehand. Out there, there are two colossal beings, both forces of nature in their own regard. But in here, as soon as the chute bursts open, the duality of man and beast begins to fade. This is the PBR on CBS Sports Network. All right, very, very nice. We go from you know stubborn bulls to stubborn Patrick McDonald as to will he take <laughs> My show that that was not a good segue, but hey, we have fun here on the early wedge. And as Sia just said in the chat, smash the like and you'll make us all happy. All right, Patrick, you're gonna go with a couple of uh all right. Now now wait a second here. Well, we're gonna start. I guess let's get right to it. Why are you Rory McElroy was in the news this week? There were rumors that he was getting a, a bag of 830 million <laughs> and partial ownership of lit. First of all, what can you tell us about what you know about that? And then why are you fading him this week? Uh, Well, I mean, he, he talked to Todd Lewis of Golf Channel today and kind of just laughed and was like, Th this is not true. Don't know where this came from. I'm going to play on the PGA Tour for the rest of my life. If you read the article from, uh, oh gosh, it, it's escaping me the name of it. I just, uh, wait, where is it? City AM, a London-based newspaper. It was written by Matt Hardy and Frank Dallarez want to make sure they get credit for this um they lay their claim saying rory's got the offer the deal's imminent and then right below it it says we cannot verify any of this uh so, so that that's really that's i guess that's where we're at in journalism so wow <laughs> um yeah i'm just fading rory because he's not playing great at the moment for rory macro i know he had the the third place finish at the texas open but outside that just bunch of top 25s and that's not really the barometer we gauge Rory McIlroy on and Ludwig Oberg I know it's his first start here but I think the case can be na uh, made that he's a top five player in the world at the moment and he's mm -hmm. playing some great golf so I'm gonna try to ride the hot streak that he's on and then I love I love Adam Shank over Eric Cole Shank's playing some phenomenal golf mm -hmm. uh, great finish in Texas T12 at the Masters which will get him invited back next week or next year as well, which was huge for him. And then Eric Cole, I mean, for as good as his rookie season has been, it's just been kind of tough sledding lately, not doing much right. So I will take Shank minus 110 over Cole. And to answer your question, EC, I'm bowing out of the showdown. You, okay, can, call me a yeah. you can call me a coward. No, I won't. I you won't. can do a scaredy cat. I'll take it. I'll take it on the chin. But, you know, energy levels are a little low in the bank account after spending some money on Xander and Jordan Spieth, P.U. Respect. Yeah. P.U. Yeah. Well, that's week. what happens when you and I share picks. I mean, look yeah. at the three guys. Yeah, I shared, I shared the three golfers with you. We got Xander in the top 10, at least. But uh, Hideki wasn't a factor. See, you and I both had oh, him. Oh, that was and brutal. Patrick, yeah, Patrick, you and I both had Spieth. So I apologize for jinxing your out. I haven't hit an outright all season, which is terrible on this program. So I got I have to do better, but I apologize to you, and and there will be no criticism for uh, uh, passing on this showdown. All right, see ya. You're going with your boy Cbez. Uh, there's some value here over Harris English. Yeah, listen, Harris English has been a popular guy. Actually, I had him a couple months ago. I put 250 to one odds on him to win the Masters. I mean, and I only bet it because it was 250 to one. The thing about Harris English is his finishing positions as of late, like he's been able, and this is the Harris English experience, he's been able to manufacture pretty decent finishing positions in 2024. And I think that's part of the reason people 
are taking a liking to him, but I just don't think he's getting it done, particularly with the ball striking. Whereas again, Sebez, I just think is a good course fit. I mean, for one, we saw him finish 19th here last year, and we've seen him progress on this course. It was 28th, 33rd, then 19th. 19th isn't like super impressive by any means, but I, I think he knows how to play this course now. And I think that would be the fear. Like off the tee, I think he's going to know to position it, put it in the fairway. And we know he can get hot with the approach play, which frankly, Harris English hasn't been doing. And the putter can get really hot with Seabest too. So I actually, from a value standpoint, I, I actually think this should be like minus 135. And I would still consider taking it. So I think we're getting a good price here. This is over at DraftKings, by the way, Seabest over Harris English. Uh, Chris Kirk. This is more of a fade. Uh, by the way, if you're listening the, to the podcast, it's Chris Kirk over Jason Day, also on DraftKings. Chris Kirk's minus 120. This is a fade of Jason Day. Chris Kirk, by the way, good experience here. Like, well, it's at least solid experience here. And it's certainly a good course fit. The approach play has been a little checkered, but if you look at the ball striking as a whole over the last four or five tournaments, it's actually pretty good. He's gaining in the ball striking department. You know who you can't say that about? Jason Day. It's horrific. Like, I don't know what's going on. Um, the his game is just way off right now. He's been solid with the short game and that could help him here for sure. I just don't think he's putting himself in play at all because of what he's doing uh, off the tee and with the ball striking in general, I should say the approach in general. So I like the value here too. Chris Kirk minus 120 over Jason Day. Uh, one quick point, uh, Finau over JT, Hep Sterling asks in the chat and he says JT is done. Like that might be true, but Finau hasn't been very good either. So I think you're just getting six of one, half a dozen of the other. Yeah, just pass. I, yeah, I don't see any value there. And I do want to point out one thing, because Moshi talked about how he's he's just starting DFS. He's starting to get better. This uh, Ludwig over Rory matchup just sparked something in me to look at some ownership. And it's early, right? But the thing about Rory is his ownership isn't super high. And I'd say the same about Scotty Scheffler. I think people do fear the letdown thing, maybe the baby thing. So the ownership will rise on both of them. But if you're playing DFS, it would be good to know like Wednesday night, like where the ownership is on these two guys, because I agree that Rory is not going to have a great tournament. But if he's like under 10% in this field, you have to play him in DFS. And I would say the same about Scotty Scheffler if he was under like 20%. I don't mean that he should be, they should be in all of your lineups, but you have to speculate on these guys a little bit given their talent versus what their ownership is. Just something to think about with these star names who right now aren't getting a lot of ownership. Patrick, which is worse, uh, Jason Day's recent ball striking or his outfits at the Masters? Uh, I guess it's ball striking. I'm not a, uh, you know, I just put it out there on the internet for people to run wild with their opinions. Some mm -hmm. are bad, but I don't think all are that bad. Masters was yeah. a tough, a tough, uh, tough scripting for him. You had a, a tweet that went viral last week. I saw was that was that the Jason Day? Uh, you did. It went, it went, see, that's like that's legitimate. Oh, uh, sorry. Everyone. Yes, I, I should know better. To, I should know you better. You have to be more specific for me, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I just saw. I click on it like it shows up on your who you know feed. Well, clearly, because you and I are connected on on Twitter and you're like blowing up. You got all these people. There's more likes that are. I'm thinking, wow, I'm I'm on with a couple of celebrities. here. I, I like this, <laughs> you know, two celebrities. And then this guy with a couple of uh, picks this week, Cam Davis, plus 115 over JT Poston. Uh, we talked about Cam Davis a little bit or it was mentioned earlier in the show. But Poston hasn't posted. He hasn't posted better than a T30 in his last four. Listen, he has three top tens and two missed cuts in his last five here. Okay, that's fine. I get that. The recent form, not great. Now, Davis in his last two weeks, T21, T12, and I think as Sia said, he's coming around. His game is really turning a corner. He was also two eight. He was T18 at the API in his last three here: T25, T3, T7. And when I say the the letter T, it means he tied in those positions. Just want to point that out. Nonetheless, the line value makes this one a good play for me here. Give me that plus 115 on Cam Davis, and then. I know. I, I, I this is. I'm giving myself a C grade for this pick, but I just can't help myself. Jordan Speed over Max Homa. So the first one was at DraftKings that I gave out. This one's at Bet365. Jordan Speed over Max Homa at minus 120. Homa has a T41 and a missed cut lifetime here. Speed has five top 12s and seven appearances, and in the last two years, he's been in a playoff both years. Went one and two. It doesn't get much better than that. I, I I don't even know what to say about Jordan Speed. I'm trying. These three, I said in San Antonio that I was going to pick Jordan Speed each of these three weeks. He played okay, got a top 10 in San Antonio. Last week was an utter failure. I don't even know what to do with this week. I, we're going to try it. 
I understand if you don't want to go down this route. Patrick, do you approve, disapprove? You, you like speed a little bit here? No. Hey, when he won in 2022, you know what he did at Augusta National? He missed the cut. There you go. I I actually, I researched that for my article at sportsline.com. And by the way, you can find these guys. These guys are everywhere on sportsline.com uh, and cbssports.com. So check out uh, the three of us have articles, but these guys are the pros and I'm just another guy trying to, you know, write an article to get some, get some play here. Uh, anyways. All right. So that's, let's move on to finishing positions. See, we got a theme here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if, what are we on uh, four straight sec or three straight uh, segments of the show with a Cbez mention, you just can't help yourself, can you? That's right. And what's funny is he wasn't actually on my first round leader card because that's where we kicked off the Cbez experience. I had Lucas Glover there at fifty to one, and then I just decided to switch him out for Cbez. Just take that for what it's worth. I know a lot of people like Lucas Glover, and it's for pretty good reason. It's certainly a good course fit. Uh, but yeah, T thirty. Listen, don't forget this is like a seventy person field, and and I will say this: this isn't one of those situations where, like at the Masters, where like the very bottom, it's like a bunch of amateurs and and. and Old, you know, past winners that that really don't have much of a shot. By the way, shout out to VJ Singh, who made the cut mm -hmm. and was like pretty yeah. good for for a few days there at 61 years old, I believe. Is it 61? I don't know. Somebody can correct me on that. Uh, but either way, Cbez, like I, I do think a T30 is in play here at, at nearly even money, minus 105. Again, I love the approach play. Uh, history's not bad. I love what he can do with the putter. Getting hot with the putter is obviously critical at any course. Um, but I, I just think Cbez is one of those guys that fits really nicely in that 20 to 40 range. You can't play him T40 because, again, we only have 70 people in this field. And T40 would be somewhere in like the minus 180 range or minus 175, something like that. Will Zalatoris is my next one. We haven't talked a ton about him. He'll come up later in the show. Listen, this is one of those things where, to me, it's a little mysterious why Will Zalatoris isn't getting attention. Because let, let's just go back to the last five tournaments. The Genesis T2, Arnold Palmer, API T4. Then he gets cut from the players, T74 at the Houston Open. And we're like, hey, what's going on with, with Will Zalatoris? Like, can we even play him at the Masters? Well, yeah, the answer is you can because he was T9 and he gained 7.28 ball striking. And he did it with the approach play and the off the tee game. And he only lost 1.49 with the putter. Like, that's that's significant. But it's not like the, the week before where he lost seven, literally seven strokes with the putter. Or the week before that where he lost almost two strokes with the putter. And you might be saying, well, see, you're giving me a history with Will Zalatoris that isn't very good when it comes to the putter. Okay, that's true. But that's a three-tournament sample size history. The four tournaments before that, which wasn't that long ago, by the way, he gained with the putter. So considering where the ball striking is at with Will Zalatoris, I, and that this is a lesser field than it was last week and that he profiles very well for this course, a T20 at plus 105 is very much in play. And, and I think there's more in play for Will Zalatoris. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, and we'll talk about Zal a little bit later on in the show. Now, Virtual makes a good point here. He says, I feel C is often early on, guys, before Wyndham Clark became Wyndham Clark. C you mentioned him on here all the time. And you also nailed uh, Jaeger, Stephen Jaeger, who you had talked about for the better part of two years. Is Bez your next guy that you're predicting superstardom for that we should get in on early? No, he's not a guy that we want to get in on early from an outright standpoint. But if we're talking other markets like T30 and, but you know, he's like people have been betting him in the top 40 market in the top 30 market and, and, and maybe in DFS. So I, mean, I don't even know that I'm particularly early on on him. But from an outright standpoint, I did believe in Steven Yeager. From an outright standpoint, I did believe in Wyndham Clark. And there's probably some names in this tournament that, that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not looking at them right now that I'm waiting for their first or maybe second or third win. Uh, but Cbez probably not one of them, especially in a field like this, to actually win the tournament. All right, Patrick, who are your super sleepers? You know, who are the, who is the next Wyndham Clark in your opinion? Who is the next Steven Yeager who's going to be in? I'm, I'm throwing this right. You know, you don't have any. I, I I made five picks in this. You have nothing here, so I got to ask you. Give us a couple of sleepers that we should keep an eye on over the next three or three plus months this season. Um, Grayson Sig, obviously. He's going to win this week in uh, Corrales, Punta Cana. If you there need you a bet, go. if you need a bet over there, he's he's my guy. I think he's seventy to one. Uh, sleepers, man, I don't know. I like I like the cut of Joe Highsmith's uh, jib. You know, he, he had a good start there at the uh, the Texas Open and the Puerto Rico Open as well. Really talented rookie. Um, hey, oh, I don't know. while he's oh, thinking, I don't he, know. Like, Patrick, maybe you have one more to give, but while he was thinking, I did. I don't want to forget because he just gave out a Corrales pick. 
I think Victor Perez, this number's probably been bet down. I'm looking at it right now. I think Victor Perez at 30 to 1 is a pretty good look. Just wanted to throw that out there. But this is right. Corrales Punta Cana, of course. Since we are not going to talk about the Corrales Punta Cana on this show, I will say this. If Victor Perez or Grayson Sig win this week, I will give each of you a $50 bet to bet on a future tournament uh, in the next month. So if, if one of your two guys hits, one of each, Perez or Grayson Sig, I will give each of you yeah, 50 bucks and we'll we'll put it on the line for one of your outrights and we'll go from there. Just gonna throw that out there. All right, I got I have five picks in this in this segment. I'll run through them here quickly. Uh I have a four top tens because I just can't help myself. Xander Shoffley, top 10 plus 105. These are all at Bet MGM. He has seven top tens and nine starts this season. Need I say more? Nope. <laughs> Rory McElroy, top 10 plus 125. This is a gut feeling play. I mean, the guy can't putt worse than he did last week when he actually still gained strokes on the field. And I'm not sure how, because every time they showed him on CBS, it was like, oh, Rory just three putted from 10 feet. And you're like, how is this dude gaining? Apparently he still did, per the stats. All right, uh, Cam Young, who I really, really want to play this week, even though he's on my do not play list. Plus 220 for a top 10 solo second. The Valspar T9 at the Masters. The ball striking has border has been borderline elite of late. And he was T3 here in 2022. Wyndham Clark. Plus 225. He didn't miss the cut last week. Uh, no dinner updates on where he was, where he ate last weekend after missing the cut. But he was first at Pebble Beach. Has sim similarly small greens. You try saying that three times fast. Similarly small greens. Good luck with that. <laughs> Second at API and the players uh, behind Scotty Scheffler. So we're taking a shot there. And then Emiliano Grillo, top 30, plus 125, was uh, second here in 2021 and seventh here in 2023. He can putt slightly above average as he did those two years. We'll hit this. And if not, it's probably a losing bet. Just going to say that. Now, where did I make all these bets? I made them at BetMGM because they allow ties. If you are, uh, which they're the only sports book that allows ties in, in this particular market. Now, if you are not a BetMGM customer, get with it. New BetMGM customers can sign up today and get up to $1,500 in bonus bets. Just place your first wage of at least $10, and you will receive up to $1,500 instantly if your bet loses with bonus code EDGE. That's E-D-G-E, EDGE. Coming up next, you'll find out what I'm going to do differently in the outright market this week after we hear from one of our sponsors. The best couch potatoes come from Pluto TV country. And these taters, they like all sorts of different things. Survivor Channel, Ink Master Channel. If it's got a spaceship in it, I'm probably watching it. Three channels dedicated to CSI. Whatever mood you're in, it's going to be easy watching. All right, we've got a little rapid fire here before we get to outrights. All right, uh, Patrick, I'll start with you. Jared says, first round matchup, Cam Davis plus 110 over Sam Burns. Who you like? Uh, I'll roll with Cam Davis. Yeah, I know C likes him, obviously, playing good, has great course history. Sam Burns kind of in uh, no man's land and, and with a baby on the way as well. So, yeah, I'll roll with the Aussie. See ya. Japan says Harris English top 20 at plus 170, yay or nay? Uh, it's probably a nay to me. In this field, it's too loaded for me to put. I, I like the number. I like I like the find at plus 170, but I'm not betting it. Nope. Uh, virtual Wyndham's meal only had 54 courses, not 72. I can confirm that, uh, yeah, he did not go the full four days, just like Pebble Beach, where it was only a 54 hole tournament. All right, now let's bring up my amazing list of do not bet. Can we just get Scheffler out there? Like, <laughs> I, mean, I, know a, like, I know, I know what you're trying to do here, and I know I made I'm like the rest of this list has been brilliant, but it also helps Scotty Scheffler. Has won three times. I mean, what was I thinking? I get that. All right. So there are a few players that I like this week. Cam Young being one of them. Can't lay, obviously. Lowry, who Sia talked about. Uh, Keith Mitchell's band. He's not in this tournament. Is he in Punta Cana? Is he? Uh, he's not. He's yeah. not. Okay. I was going to say, if he was playing there, I'll I'll give him to you both <laughs> in that $50 bet. Because Keith Mitchell's still not winning uh, a tournament anytime soon. All right. Let's see what we have here. Uh, Patrick, we're going to start with you because you're going to the bargain basement here. You're going, you're fading top of board. Your rust bus is back in play, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got any time you get Russell Henley over 40 to one, you bet him <laughs> in a, in a limited field like this. Come on. Uh, gr just great course fit. He's, he's playing well, uh, coming off that Texas open. Wasn't a great masters, especially when he finished top five the year before. Um, but still 42 to one. I really like the number. Shane Lowry, 45 to one for all the reasons Sia said. This guy has been smashed in the outright market. I think he opened around 
like 70 to one at some mm. spots. Uh, but honestly, I think anything over like 40, if you can get the 45 to one, I, I still like it. Mm -hmm. And then Denny McCarthy, uh, you, you kind of see a theme with all these guys, fairway finders, good wedge players. Lowry's not a great putter, but McCarthy and Henley are. Um, so I'm going to lean into those two. And this is a guy who would have just won the Texas open, if not for a guy named Akshay Batia, and he would have won it going away. So he's playing yeah. some great golf. The T to green games kind of matching that putter slowly but surely and he has a couple good results here so i will go with denny at 65 you know what your grade moves up to an a at those odds for denny the way he's been playing lately i really really like that pick and will probably add to my card i didn't even think about him but you're right i mean he put forth at at uh tpc san antonio he would have won every other tournament in the last 160 based on strokes gained against the field and of course mm -hmm. he runs into a buzzsaw and batia also that shot in the playoff hole was really really bad it looked like one of my wedges uh Not which good. just ends up 20 yards short but yeah i mean it happens see ya patrick cantley's on my do not bet list what's going on here yeah this is going to be one of those tournaments where everybody's going to be so annoyed because patrick cantley's going to win and like nobody <laughs> wants to bet on patrick cantley nobody wants to play him in dfs he's not exciting at all i'm just calling it for everybody right now patrick cantley is winning the rbc heritage and well. everybody's going to be annoyed so why not put some money on it so that you're not as fully annoyed as everyone else listen this is a guy who was pretty good at the masters i mean if you look at the ball striking he was great the putter not so good but he's been fine with the putter at the rbc heritage you know how i know that because he's good everywhere at harbor town he's third second missed cut third over his last four efforts here i mean he's been very good and again because he's in sort of that superstar mold i'm not really worried about him like regressing back to the patrick cantley of of, of earlier in 2024 and for the record he's been good off the tee the approach play has been very spotty the putter's been very spotty but again patrick cantley coming off a good tournament going to a place that he absolutely dominates in terms of top fiving it every time he shows up like the number at 16 to 1. Wish I got it at 18 or 20, but I'll take it at 16 to 1. That is, by the way, at BetMGM. At other places, it's 14 to 1, which, you know, listen, I, I would still bet it there, but 16 is certainly a lot more appetizing than 14. I won't belabor the point on Will Zalatoris. I just went on to a long rant about why I liked him to top 20. With all of that analysis in mind, I absolutely think if the putter gets going, we know what he can do with the ball striking. Absolutely think 28 to 1 is a good number. And then Patrick already addressed Shane Lowry. He's obviously got to bounce back with the putter, but he's been very good for since the Florida swing, essentially, from a ball striking standpoint. So 45 to 1 is a pretty nice number on a guy that can win this tournament. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I right, Now, here's where I'm getting smart. At FanDuel, they are offering this market. You're, I'm getting the winner without Ludwig. Rory, Xander, and Scotty. And I'm not getting much worse odds than than everywhere. I mean, Zal, I'm getting him at 20 to 1. You're getting him at 28 to 1. And I don't have to deal with these four guys who I very well think could win. And any of these guys, I mean, probably not, not picking Ludwig here, but I would pick the other three as my top three this week. So I feel fine. Well, and Matt Fitzpatrick, he won here last year. He wins at places with small greens. Remember that U.S. Open 2022? Uh, at the country club, I believe some of the smallest screens that they that the players have played in or played on in on whatever it is over the last few years. Will Zalatoris, I mean, listen, he he shows up in big events. He had a rough patch there, but Sia has has you know spoken great of him, so I'm all about it. And Cam Young, I mean, listen, he's on the don't bet list, but the way that I did this doesn't count. Doesn't count. It yeah, doesn't count. So this is how <laughs> I'm gonna bet. Now, if I want to bet players on the do not bet list, then you just bet them outright. You just bet them without, you know, Scotty Scheffler or whoever. To, in this one, I'm getting four players. So if Rory, you know, spikes, don't have to worry about it. Xander spikes, fine. Xander's due to win, by the way. I think we all can agree. Like, it's been two years for Xander. We're just going to keep betting. He, the guy's finishing top 10 every week. You, you have, yeah. Patrick, we have to keep betting Xander until he wins, right? He's so good. He is so good. But he's never – here's the thing. Like, see, he's never in contention. That's the problem with Xander. Like, he's top 10, but he's not competing for the win. Am except, I right? Except, shout out to GGen75, when he is. And when that happens, by the way, he completely falls apart immediately. Like, this guy, again, the on switch, it's just not there for some people. It's, that doesn't mean he's a he's a bad golfer. He's a very good golfer. He's one of the best in the world. But that on switch, we saw it with Denny and Akshay and, of course, Scotty Scheffler. And we've seen it this entire year. There's no on switch on this guy. 
Uh, hey, listen, I'm, he's going to win this year. He's going to win. Keith Mitchell will not win this year. Xander Shoffley will win this year, maybe multiple times, and we're going to have it. But if he does this week, so I'm protected. Fitzpatrick at plus 1,600, Zalatoris plus 2,000, Cam Young at plus 2,000. And if that happens, I'm going to feel great and count this as an outright win for myself. Now, here's what I want to know about our long shots in our final category here. Patrick, you had Denny McCarthy at plus 6,500 in your outrights, but your long shots are fairly close. Now, what what makes I mean, – you could put McCarthy in that category, right? Yeah, you could. I kind of just I just threw him in the outline there, type of thing. Okay. Way to call him out, EC. I, I, I just, you know, I noticed that, and I'm like, yeah, Denny's a great long shot at plus 6,500, but you're feeling confident enough. Do you, when it comes to long shots versus you know regular outrights, do you put a different amount of units, or do you recommend a different amount of units on each? I, I bet to win the same with every single bet. So obviously, yeah. yeah so like the 80 to one and 71 is going to be less than. Uh, so I have like two X on Henley compared to Glover this week. Okay. See, so yeah, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about it as far as your outrights versus your long shots? Yeah. It, like a lot of people do it Patrick's way. That's probably the best way to do it. Mine is really based on feel more than anything else. Like I'm not a spreadsheet guy where like I'm tracking every single outright and the return and every single first round leader. Um, if I think there's tremendous value on, on a 70 to one shot, then I'm probably going to put a little bit more on that 70 to one shot. But if, if I, if I think it's just like a very speculative play then I'm just going to like sprinkle a, a few bucks on it. So that's, that's what it comes down for me. I usually have three, four or five outrights and I have a couple that I'm maybe a little bit more confident in from a value standpoint. I'll put a few extra bucks on those. So getting back to Patrick, got Chris Kirk and Lucas Glover uh, twice the bet on Henley that you do Glover, but you still like both these guys. Why? Yeah, Chris Kurt's just been – he's been great. He's driving the ball great. The iron play took a step last week at Augusta National, and so did the putter. So I'm all aboard him uh, at 70-1. to 1. And then Lucas Glover also quietly very good the last three weeks. Uh, kind of found something there at the Ballast Bar Championship, carried it over to the Texas Open, and was hovering, I would say hovering at the Masters, kind of in and out of the top ten uh, throughout the weekend. So – Got to be accurate here. Got to hit your irons very well. That is Lucas Glover to a T. So I think 80 to 1 is a pretty good price on him. So your grade goes up even more in my book because both Kirk and Glover have won elevated events, uh, essentially, over the last year. Uh, Glover oh. won twice in a row, including the first leg of the FedEx Cup playoffs, and Chris Kirk won the century, which was a limited field, no cut, uh, $20 million purse. So these guys in this event, now I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> just for my betting purposes, because I'll lose. But one guy that I actually might bet this week, and I and I almost included him on my list is Brian Harmon. See, your grade just keeps skyrocketing. You get like an A plus 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 in my book. <laughs> Why do you like Harmon this week? Yeah, I was debating as my last person in uh, with Brian Harmon, guys like Akshay Batia. Lucas Glover was definitely in that conversation. And I got to say, Akshay Batia, from a metric standpoint, looked way better. And when you look at what Brian Harmon has done with the ball striking in particular over the last month or so, like it hasn't looked very, very good. But first of all, his record here is really pretty great for, for Brian Harmon, right? He's seventh, 35th, 13th, 28th over his last four, like certainly comfortable here. And he's been really good with the putter. And we know he, he tends to be granted. He missed the cut at the masters last week. He tends to be like a guy that shows up kind of surprisingly in loaded fields. And he, obviously we saw that at the open championship last year, but, but he's the guy that's always on my radar when like, nobody's really looking his way. So I think 55 to one is reasonable. He's got it. He's got to rein in the ball striking a little bit. As far as a first round leader, long shot Svensson's funny because he is your classic first round leader pick because there's no way for four rounds he can be anywhere close to good with the putter. If you look at what he's done in all of 2024 uh, with the putter leading back to probably 2023, it's been really, really bad. But his approach play as of recent has actually been really good. And if he can just spike with the putter in any appreciable way for one singular round, I think 75 to one makes a lot of sense for a guy who can play historically. Like he has like been a ball striker. He can play positional golf. He can get it in the fairway, be dialed in on approach and sometimes get hot with the putter for a round. So I think at 75 to one, he's super sneaky. All right. Well, I can't help myself. We haven't mentioned the word parlay on the show and that's how I play my outright. So it is what it is. Sometimes you have, you hit them big and sometimes, well, you don't, uh, it'd be nice if I actually picked an outright winner too. That, that would actually help. Uh, top 10 parlay here. I love this one. Xander, because that's all he does is top 10. And Cam Young, who I think is going to spike this week, 
plus 600. You can find all these at DraftKings. Top 10 parlay, Rory and Zal, Will Zalatoris, uh, plus 750. We're going, we're rolling with these top 10s. I'm going to hit some some top 10s. And then we got this top finish parlay, plus 1600. Going half a unit on this one. Uh, maybe even less than that. But hey, I just throw that out there. Uh, half of my normal unit that I would normally bet on the others. Uh, whatever that means to you. Uh, Rory McIlroy, top five. Colin Morikawa, top 10. And Ludwig, top 20. Plus 1600. That is juicy to me. What do you think, Sia? Actually, I wanted to ask you. So these are pre-made parlays, right? That Correct. You and them. they include ties. Yeah. Yep. Because I really wish the Rory one, the the plus because I like the plus sixteen hundred one. I like listen. Like I don't I don't play these, but plus sixteen hundred is a pretty rich number. I just wish Rory was T ten instead of T five, which would like let's put it this way: if it was Rory T ten, Colin T ten, Ludwig T twenty. And it paid like plus twelve hundred or plus eleven hundred instead of well plus twelve hundred instead of plus sixteen hundred. I'd like that quite a bit, but even as it stands right now, I I, I don't hate that. I think Colin Morikawa could have a pretty great tournament. Ludwig inside the top twenty makes obviously a ton of sense. It really comes down to Rory being like pretty pretty good, and you know he can finish T five uh, or top five. So I, I like that one. That one I think is actually at plus sixteen hundred. I think that's worth a few bucks. I think Rory this way. Well, you also like Zal this week. Yes. So Rory and I mean Zal top ten. We're getting you know plus seven fifty there. So the thing, the reason I like these, and you can find them generally, uh, FanDuel has you know tourney specials. They have some every week, I, and DraftKings has these. Is you get ties. So if Rory and Zal finish T10, both T10, we're getting played. We're getting paid out on that plus 750. We're not getting plus you know 375 or plus whatever it is depending on how many they tie with. So that, mm-hmm. that I think is really important to me. All right, before we go, one guy that we haven't talked about, he is not in the field this week, is Tiger Woods. And he made the cut and he did he did great uh, for Monday or you know Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday was what it was. And he shot probably worse than Patrick McDonald would have shot. All right, see ya. When's the next time we're going to see Tiger Woods? Oh, gosh. I, I don't even want to, like Patrick's the guy to ask that question. I don't even want to speculate on, on when we're going to see him next. All right. I mean, I, the, the the PGA championship, I mean, we, we think he's playing there, right? Yeah, he, he pretty much he conver- confirmed that pretty much after the Masters that he's going to be taking scouting trips to Valhalla, Pinehurst, and uh, Pinehurst number two. So, what would you do from a betting perspective with Tiger going forward? Oh, uh, just watch him, watch him, and have <laughs> have fun. You, you mean, don't need you don't need to bet on Tiger. You don't need to. The only viable bet this last week, and it was a bet we talked about, like that I talked about with Mike McClure on HQ, we talked about it on this show as well, was whether Tiger would make the cut or not. And you were getting, in some instances, you were getting even money or even like plus-ish money uh, for him to make the cut at some books. I think that, and I was leaning on the make the cut side of that. I might have mentioned it on the show. I, I think once you get to round three and round four with Tiger Woods, you know, you're, you're really kind of asking for it. If you're like, for example, like a T40 or a T20 on Tiger Woods, like that, unfortunately that has to go all four rounds. So to me, the only, the only viable bets for Tiger Woods are matchup bets in rounds one and two specifically, or make the cut bets where you don't have to worry about what he's going to do day three and day four. Unfortunately, the injuries are taking a toll. I don't know how much more we're going to see him, but I do think there is some value in betting him in the first couple of rounds, considering what the perception of him is right now. Fair enough. I think that's great analysis, and I'm sure we will talk about Tiger much more at Valhalla, Pinehurst number two. We'll talk about the Open Championship. I don't know if he'll make the trip across the pond. We'll get there at least one tournament at a time, but it was good to see Tiger back in action, seeing that Sunday red, even though didn't mean a heck of a lot this week. But, hey, good for the kid, Neil Shipley from Ohio State, uh, getting a chance of a lifetime to play that fourth round. With, he went uh, to Ohio State, but also went to James Madison. Oh, there, there you go. See ya. There you go. I'm wearing the Shipley uh, JMU purple here. I'm just thinking about Ohio State. I, I, you know, didn't even realize that. Sorry, see ya, guys. Always fun uh, being on with you. Thanks, uh, thanks for the entertainment as always. Hope you guys out there got a lot out of it. These guys are geniuses when it comes to betting these markets, and uh, it's always great to learn from them every week. Thanks to producer Jake, who does a great job. Uh, putting everything together, except not deleting Scotty Scheffler off my do not bet list. Then again, I don't blame him. Uh, I'm for Sian Ajad and Patrick McDonald. I'm Eric Cohen. As I always like to say, let's hit it big. Good luck.